watercolour painting mistakes. That's what we're talking about in today's video and I've got seven things that you really shouldn't be concerning yourself with. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolour as well as drawing, mixed media, even a little bit of business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon you can get notified every time I upload a new video. I make at least one free video a week here on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content for Patreon subscribers. So though this video is entitled watercolour painting mistakes that you don't have to worry about, it actually goes for pretty much any painting medium. So I'm going to talk about these mistakes. Most of this uh, video is a talking video, but where I have uh, things that I need to actually show you, I will uh, drop in some B-roll so I can show you how to fix some of the mistakes. So we're going to look at each of these mistakes. Some of these mistakes uh, you shouldn't worry about because you can fix them and I'm going to show you how to fix them or explain what to do. And some of these mistakes you shouldn't be worrying about just because they really aren't anything to concern yourself with. There's far too much worrying about the finished result and not enough worrying about the process, in my opinion, when it comes to, uh, to learning to paint. So let's get started on these, uh, these seven things that you don't have to worry about. Now, at the end of the video, I'm going to tell you about one thing when it comes to painting and drawing that you do need to worry about. So keep watching to the end for that one. But all of the rest, you can dismiss them after watching this video and hopefully it'll give you a little bit more relaxation to your painting, a little bit more enjoyment and a bit less stress. So this first one is when you have done a painting and you find that it looks different to the original source image, to the thing that's in front of you, or more often to the, uh, the photograph that you're using. And it can be really disappointing, can't it? You look at the, uh, the photograph and then you look at your work and it just doesn't look the same. Now, what I always encourage my students to ask themselves is would a stranger know? For instance, uh, you know, if you've painted a flower and you've ended up with the wrong shade of pink, if you show this painting to a stranger and they don't have the original photograph, are they going to know any difference? And you know, the majority of times the answer is no. The building's too big or too small or it's in the wrong place. The tree leaves are a different color. The river exits the side higher up than it does in the photograph. All of these problems are to do with inaccuracy, so you haven't got it quite right. But do they actually matter? Now, I'm not saying that you should dismiss them entirely, because obviously if you're trying to paint realistically and you keep getting paintings that don't look like the photograph, then you need to at least do some work on that. You need to consider why, and you need to consider what would have worked better to get you more accuracy. So don't dismiss this, but nonetheless, it's not something to really, really haul yourself over the coals over and beat yourself up about. Ask yourself, you know, is this mistake so awful that you know anyone looking at this painting would see the mistake? Or is it just something that is bothering you because it doesn't look exactly like the source material? And remember that there is such a thing as artistic license. You're allowed to do a flower or a fruit or even a field a different color to how it is. You're allowed to do things different. So don't be looking for that, you know, 100% copy of the source material and ask yourself, if you show this painting to someone that doesn't see the original source of your image, are they ever going to notice? So the next mistake that might have you in a flap, and I mean that quite literally because when I see students do this, they immediately panic. And that's when you do something like drip some water on your work, make a little paint splatter, lean in your work, smudge something. Most of the time it can be fixed. Now, if you're doing oils or acrylics or gouache, all you have to do is let that area dry. If it's acrylics or oils, you can just overpaint it. If it's gouache, you can smudge it in with some water and then put another layer of paint on the top. Now, if it's watercolor, it's a little bit more tricky, but splatters can easily be fixed. I'm gonna put up some film. I'm gonna show you how I do that. Now, the trick to splatters like this, and um, this goes for most mediums actually, is to let them dry. The more you mess around with splatters and smudges when they're wet, the more you push them into the fibers of the surface that you're working on. And certainly with watercolor, what you can do is you can blot immediately. So that's not scrubbing at your paper, that's not pushing your mistake further in. If you drip some water or you make a splatter, the first thing you want to do is get some paper towel and simply blot it. So just press and lift once only and then leave it alone and let it dry. It sounds counterintuitive because if you spilt something on your carpet like some red wine, you would want to get to that before the stain set in. You would want to lift it out as quickly as possible. But the opposite is true with watercolor. When your paper is wet, it's fragile. And all you're going to do is push that stain further into the fibers of the paper. So let it get completely dry. And then I want you to take some cotton wool or cotton padding 
and I want you to wet it, but really, really a tiny amount. Squeeze out as much as you can. It needs to be barely, barely damp, particularly if you're working on top of an area that has other paint on it, because you can make a watermark just by using the cotton wool. What I want you to do then is consider if there are any areas that you need to protect while you're scrubbing out your mistake. So this may mean putting some masking tape around the area. If you do this, you want to, again, make sure your paint is completely dry. Stick the masking tape to your clothing a few times so that you pick up some lint and it's not too sticky because it can tear your paper. And then you're going to place that around the little mark and that will protect the pre-painted areas while you're working. And then you're going to take your cotton wool and very, very gently work in circles. Now, whether or not the whole stain comes out depends on the pigment that you've used, but it certainly will lift out enough to be over paintable. Now, what if this stain went on a white area? Often you can lift it back to white paper, but what if you can't get it out completely? Lift it out as much as you can and then just put something on top of it. Maybe there wasn't anything in that gap. Perhaps you can put a leaf in. Maybe you can extend the sky color. You can find a way of fixing it. The main thing with these splatters and these smudges, particularly with watercolor, is not to panic. The first thing you do is blot, then you leave alone, you let it dry, and then when it's dry, you lift out the stain as much as you can, and then again let it dry, and if you need to, put a layer of paint on top. There's almost nothing that can't be fixed, and as I say to people, there's always collage. You can literally just stick something over the top. Don't abandon a painting. Just because you make one little smudge or error, it's always fixable. There's always something you can do. So the next thing you shouldn't worry about is when you have done some areas of your painting really well and then you mess up one thing. This is just a natural part of the learning process. This is just something that happens. So when you first start learning to paint and draw, you might not be very good at anything. When you have painted it and drawn for a few years, you might find you have a lot of consistency and you can do things fairly well. But in between, there's this difficult stage. There's this stage where you do a nice sky and then mess up the foreground. There's this stage where you paint a beautiful rose and then do a horrible leaf next to it. There's just always this stage where some parts aren't right. This is just a consistency thing. This is like learning to drive. If you went out learning to drive and you had a driving instructor, you might find that you'd got the hang of reversing round corners, for example, but you couldn't parallel park yet. So as you went out, if you look at your driving lesson as a painting, you'd done some parts of it really well, and there were other bits that you hadn't got the hang of yet. This is just part of learning. Don't invest yourself so much in the finished result, and particularly if you've just started painting, it is completely unrealistic to expect that you get a fully good result every single time. You need only to ask yourself in the process of this painting, have you learned something? And it's only the mistakes that teach us what not to do. It's a sad fact, but if you do something really horrendous to your sky and mess up your whole painting, I guarantee you won't do that exact same thing again because it's now fixed in your brain. It's the irritation, it's the anger, it's the annoyance that you messed up something that was going well. That's going to fix that mistake in your brain, stop you from doing it again. Just keep practicing. Consistency will only come after many years, many months, many days, many hours of practice. Don't beat yourself up if you do a painting and one area goes wrong. At this stage of the video, as always, I'm gonna ask you if you're enjoying this video and getting some value from it, could I please ask you to click that like button, that thumbs up, really helps me with the YouTube algorithm. If you like, share, subscribe, or leave me a comment, it helps my channel to grow. I'm so grateful to all of you who watch me here on YouTube. So this next mistake is something that I'm always astonished by. I'm always amazed that people get so hung up on this. I'm amazed that it's even a thing. So this is where you finish your painting and you lift off the tape around the outside and you don't get a clean edge or the tape tears or you know the paint has seeped underneath. I see people getting so stressed out by this. Now this to me is very strange because I've worked for years as a fine artist, so I've sold my paintings. And it's become a bit of a thing online to have this clean border around your work. And I get it, you know, it looks nice, doesn't it? And it's become a thing amongst crafters. And also there are some artists on YouTube who don't sell their work and that's not to be a derogatory to them because there's no reason why you have to sell your work. And there are some really good tutors on YouTube who have never sold any work just because they choose not to. They absolutely could, but they don't go down that path. It's not their business model. Again, that's fine. So they have this kind of style where maybe they work in sketchbooks or perhaps they just work on individual pieces of paper and they like that nice clean white border. Now for myself as 
an exhibiting artist and I've not only exhibited and sold work and I still sell work today, but I have actually run art exhibitions and I'm not saying that that's a better way of being an artist, I'm just saying it's a different thing that I have done and I'm just putting it out there because if there's anybody that should worry about how the presentation of a painting looks, then it's an exhibiting artist or a selling artist or someone who curates art exhibitions, which again is something that I have done. From sort of 2014 to about 2018, I was running some very, very large art fairs. I was curating, people were coming to me to see if they could place their work in the exhibition and I was looking at their work. Now there are parts of fine art where the edges are important, for instance, printmaking. So with traditional printmaking, what happens is um, you can get something called the print being out of registration. So this happens with layered prints, particularly things where the print has to be lined up in certain stages. For instance, reduction, lino printing, you have to actually line up the print each time it's pressed. And so you get an out of registration print. This is something that was considered in days gone by. It was really, really important that your print was seen to be in registration. In other words, having a clean edge. This is why traditional handmade prints are still framed with the edge of the print on show. So they have the mount or the mat around the outside and then the edge is on show. But it's become sort of a thing almost to present your paintings like that. Now, as a selling artist, as an exhibiting artist, this is not something that I ever worry about. I work on stretched paper apart from anything else. So I'm going to show you a painting. It's quite a large painting and I've sold in the last month, I don't always sell this many, but last month I sold three original paintings, large paintings like this to uh, an American buyer and they were rolled up in a tube and sent over. So here's one of my paintings. Um, can you see the edge of it? Apart from anything else, I find it really, really useful to be able to take the brush stroke and sweep it off the edge of the paper or onto the edge of the board. So for me, it's a really free way of working and I don't worry at all about my paintings having clean edges because if they ever go in a frame, it simply won't show. So here I've got a, uh, a painting mount. This, if you are American and some other countries, you will call this a mat. So we don't have mats in the UK, we have mounts and we don't mat a painting, we mount a painting. It's exactly the same thing, it's a cardboard frame. So if I show you this painting here, which is one, I think it's, it's a demonstration piece I did for my beginner's watercolour pencil flower painting course. It has grash background, which I think I did as a separate YouTube tutorial. Look at this scruffy edge. So look what happens. I'm trying to sort of keep everything on camera here. Look what happens when I place it in a mount or a mat. It looks absolutely perfect. So this is something that you just don't have to worry about. And as a professional selling artist, I think it's quite hilarious. I mean, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I think it's quite hilarious that people obsess over having clean edges around their work. I could understand it if they were printmakers. Even some printmakers consider that to be a bit old fashioned now and have rough edges on display, as do some oil painters or acrylic painters. They don't always uh, choose to clean up their edges anyway. But if you do like that nice clean edge, you can always put a mat or a mount around it. And if you are absolutely insist on, on making the tape thing work, what you need to do is you need to experiment and you need to find the exact tape and the exact paper that's going to work for you and always come off cleanly and not move around between papers and tapes. If this is something that's just so important to you that your work looks lovely and pristine around the edges, you need to find the paper and the tape that works for you and they do vary between brands and then you need to stick to that one, not change because it's probably, if you've had it working in the past and it isn't working now, if the manufacturers haven't changed anything, it's probably because you used a different tape or a different paper or even a different type of paint. So that's my advice to you. Most of all my advice is just don't worry about the edges, it really doesn't matter. So the next thing not to worry about is when you follow a tutorial, whether that's um, a course that you've bought or just something like a free YouTube tutorial, when you follow a tutorial, you follow along with a tutor and your work doesn't look as good as theirs or doesn't look the same as theirs. That's not the point of a tutorial. The point of a tutorial is to learn and you can always do these things again. Most courses give you access so that you can repeat the course. Certainly my online courses give you lifetime access. You can do the same class, the same lesson as many times as you want and the same of course goes with YouTube videos. If you've messed something up then you can just have another go. Sometimes it's good to take a break in between and perhaps go and try a different tutorial and come back to it because you can almost 
get stuck in a rut with certain types of painting and just find that you know you keep repeating those mistakes so do have a break but you know feel free to try that tutorial again but the point of the tutorial is not really to get the same results as the tutor. You won't expect the same results anyway because we all have our own individual style of painting. If you're following a tutorial of somebody that's really, really precise, perhaps it's a botanical accuracy, and you just happen to be someone that tends to paint naturally quite loosely, you can't expect to get those same results. Your results are going to be different and that's absolutely fine. Please don't get head up with worrying about whether your result looks as good as the tutor or whether it looks the same as the tutor. I've seen some people do my tutorials and I actually like their result better than mine because they have a different way of working and a different style. You should never expect to be exactly the same as the person whose tutorial you're copying. Even if you do a really good job, your natural style is going to make certain that there are some differences and that is absolutely fine. Ask yourself at the end of the tutorial, did I enjoy this? Did I learn something? That's all you need to worry about. So the next mistake not to worry about is when your colours have turned out too bright and too gaudy and just a bit in your face and perhaps not as accurate as you would want. But most of all, this can happen with things like greens in landscapes, particularly if people grab those phthalo colours, they can come out far too bright, but it can happen with other colours too. I've seen an awful lot of beaches that look like bananas because they're too bright yellow. I'm going to show you an easy fix for this. So this is possible for any medium. Of course, you can, if you're doing acrylics or something like that, you can just overpaint, but in all mediums you can use color opposites and do something called glazing. So glazing is where you mix up a transparent color and lay it on top of another color to adjust the color that shows through underneath. Now with acrylics and oils you may use some kind of medium. You can get acrylic gloss medium for example and you can make up a transparent acrylic paint which is much better with acrylics than just watering it down too much which may affect the stability of the paint. We're looking at watercolors today so I'm going to show you how to do it in watercolors. So you just need a watery mix of a color and which color do you choose? You choose the color opposite of the color that's too bright. So there are only three sets of color opposites. We've got blue and orange, we've got yellow and purple, and we've got red and green. So if any of those are too bright, for instance, if your red is too bright, you can put a little green in it. If your green is too bright, you can put a little red in it. I won't get too much into color theory, but basically what you're doing is you're ending up with a combination of all three primaries, and this always makes something a neutral. So you're pushing that bright color more towards gray or brown. You're muting the color, basically. So I've painted some swatches so let me drop some video in and I'm going to show you what happens when I take the color opposite over the top. So I've got a yellow that's too bright, I can take some purple over the top. If I've got a red that's too bright, I can take some green over the top or vice versa. And actually, if you're muting green, what I would choose rather than red is I would choose pink. So you can mute green with red, but you'll get uh, more of a brownish effect. But if you mute with pink, you'll keep it quite neutral, quite sort of gray toned. And it is a little bit easier to mute your greens that way. And if you've got orange, it's too bright, you can mute it with a little bit of blue or vice versa. So you want to be careful with this. This is why I always recommend swatching your colors. So if you've swatched your colors in the course of your painting on a scrap of paper, here's your opportunity. You've now got a dried swatch of that paper. You can mix up your glaze and put it over the top and see if it adjusts the paint color correctly. If not, what I'd advise you to do is mix the glaze up fairly watery, put a layer on, and then if you need to put more on, it's quite hard to pull it back from that if you go too far with it. So just start gradually, but do let it dry in between each layer. When you let watercolors dry, the glue that they're mixed with, the adhesive that's actually in the binder, which is usually gum arabic, will help to stick the paint to the paper a little bit. So if you are adjusting in multiple layers, what you want to do is allow the paint to dry in between each layer. But you can see how easy it is to adjust those colors and knock out that brightness. So if you get to the end of the painting, you think, oh, it's too bright, it's too gaudy. I don't like this color here, it doesn't look right. You can just mute it down by putting a glaze of an opposite color. If you've forgotten the color opposites, I'll list them in the description of this video. So the next mistake is almost the opposite of the last one, and that's having a painting that's too wishy-washy. This often happens. It can happen with things like acrylics when you've just mixed your colors all too muted. Just need to go on top and brighten them up a little bit. But it often happens with watercolors, and sometimes it's a mistake that beginners make of almost abandoning their paintings too early. So you get to sort of that mid-stage where you've got paint on everything. It looks a little bit wishy-washy. Maybe you're not so happy with the result, and you just abandon it. 
it's often a thing that you need to go through. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a picture up of uh, one of my paintings. And what I've done is on a graphics program, I've just dropped the contrast down, dropped the saturation down, and I've shown you how sort of dull and wishy-washy it looks. And then I'll put up the picture as it actually is, as it was when I finished it. And you can see that the shadows and the darks make it much stronger. So often it's just a matter that you needed to go in with much stronger darks rather than sort of faffing around halfway through and putting in a little bit of shadow, a little bit more shadow, a little bit more shadow. Perhaps you needed to go right in and just put one strong shadow in at the end. Now it's really, really scary to do that and there is a worry that you are gonna mess up your painting. So if you've got a painting and you think it's finished but it's really looking wishy-washy, what I'd encourage you to do is go in with some strong darks. And if you're saying to me, well, I might mess it up, True, you might mess it up, but if you're already unhappy with it, then really what have you got to lose? Sometimes you do, when you're learning things, just have to mess up a few things. And I do encourage you, if you've got a painting where everything is just dull and muted, to think about going in either with some stronger brights or some stronger darks at the end. Put some really dark, strong shadows in and see if that improves it. As I said, if you're not happy with the result anyway, you really have nothing to lose. So we talked at the beginning of this video of the only mistake that you really have to worry about. I'm going to tell you about that in a moment. But before I tell you about that, I just want to offer you something for free. There's no such thing as a free lunch, they say, but actually there is such a thing as a free mini course. So I have made a free mini course for you and you're asking yourself, what's the catch? There's no catch whatsoever. I just want to get my name out a bit more widely. So I've made a free course. It's a beautiful rose tutorial. If you pop into the description of this video, you can just click a link, make an account on my Thinkific site and you'll be able to access that free mini course tutorial. It may help you to paint along with me stage by stage and get those better results. I really hope you enjoy it. All I ask is that perhaps if you do enjoy it, you share it with other people. At the time of making this video, we almost finished making it. So if it's not down in the video description yet, it will be up within a couple of days. I'll add it into the video description. If it's not there, if you're just watching this video like an hour after it's out and we haven't quite got it ready yet, then just download one of the free PDFs that are in the description or if you're already on my mailing list, you'll get an email on Saturday that will give you a link to that free tutorial. Now let's get on with this mistake that I told you about that's the only thing that you really do have to concern yourself with. So there's a mistake with paintings that people make that can't be fixed. So what is this mistake? It's not actually a painting mistake, it's an underdrawing mistake. So time and time again, I'll be on a Facebook group or a Facebook forum and somebody will ask what's wrong with this painting and people will start giving advice or needs a little bit more shading here, perhaps adjust this color there. And I look at it and I think to myself, the drawing is wrong, the underdrawing is completely wrong. Now we talked at the beginning about this idea of your painting doesn't have to look exactly like the tutorial or exactly like the thing that you're doing. But if you've got something really majorly wrong, and I see this most often with uh, two areas, I see this with building perspective, and I see this with portraits. If you have got that underdrawing wrong, it doesn't matter how much paint you put on it, it's not going to fix it. It's never ever a good painting comes out of a bad drawing. So this is just something to be aware of, and that's the only time I would suggest that you don't go any further with your painting. If you realize that you really have messed up the underdrawing, not just that it looks different to the subject, which is fine, it doesn't have to look like the exact rose that you were drawing, it can look like a different rose, but if it doesn't look like a rose at all, or if it looks completely wrong, then maybe you should think about stopping and starting another painting. I've got a really good video that's going to tell you about the 10 most common drawing mistakes that I have seen my students make. It's going to help you avoid making these mistakes yourself so that you never get to that dreadful stage in your painting when you realize that nothing can fix it. You can watch that video right now.